An overview of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verse 1, through chapter 11, verse 13, Experiencing God. We are now in the fifth section of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus' Journey to Die, Messianic Signs and Teaching. How to Experience God Through Obedience, Through His Holy Spirit, Through Showing Kindness, Through Jesus' Teaching, and Through Persistent Prayer. Experience God Through Obedience. After this, the Lord appointed seventy-two others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Yes, the harvesters pray for more harvesters, most of whom will be found in the harvest. Go, I am sending you out as lambs amongst wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, Peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, then your peace will rest upon him. If not, it will return to you. Those who evangelize are not to carry a begging purse. And we are always looking for those who promote peace, that is, those who enjoy good, harmonious relationships with others. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. Anyone who provides hospitality to you, God will bless in turn, prospering them more than what they give. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. This requires strategic planning, locating and entering towns that are not already saturated with the gospel. You heal the sick by praying and asking God to do so. If they respond to the healing, then be sure to tell them the gospel. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. But whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. When you speak the truth about Jesus to others, they come under conviction of the Holy Spirit who is seeking to convince them. The seventy-two returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Whenever you send out workers, be sure to welcome them back and listen carefully to their reports and then plan with them the next steps. Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given to you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. According to the book of Revelation, or Apocalypse, chapter 12, Satan was thrown out of heaven after the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Now with the preaching of the gospel, the devil and demons are defeated. Thus you have absolute authority to cast out evil spirits, from believers and unbelievers alike. They must submit to you. But do not rejoice over this. Rejoice rather that God knows who you are. From these texts, we can draw a number of principles and practices that lead to success in evangelism and in church planting. 
First, appoint and send workers. Do not ask for volunteers, for the first volunteer will be unfit marginals who will discourage gifted workers from volunteering. This is the task of the Mother Church, to appoint and to send out, normally in small teams. Then pray for more workers. New workers will be found in new little churches amongst recent believers. And then work with households. The gospel normally flows through family systems, friendship circles, and co-workers. Look for peacemakers. These are normally individuals or households who enjoy good relations with others and can prove quite winsome by inviting others to hear the gospel. And then accept hospitality. Ground-level workers normally must be self-supporting in order not to become dependent on outside funding. And then do not move around. Avoid distractions. It is far more strategic to leave one believing household in a town than a number of individuals who have heard the gospel and do nothing about it. And you must enter new towns. This requires strategic planning, identifying those localities that are not already saturated with the gospel. And then heal the sick. To do this, you boldly ask God to intervene. And you expel demons. You command evil spirits to leave. If they manifest, then order them to be quiet and to leave. And leave human rejectors. That is, not to waste your time or your career dealing with persons or with communities that are not responding. And exercise authority over evil. Anyone who shares the gospel enters into spiritual warfare, and you must exercise your authority. Then expect the Holy Spirit to bring conviction to those who hear the gospel. God himself will call them to respond. And then return and report to your coach or to, or to your ministry director on what happened and what are new opportunities allowing you to lay new plans for your next action steps. And then rejoice to be saved. There is perhaps no greater joy than that in the birth of new children. It is the same at the new birth of new believers. Experience God through his Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. The wise and learned are often Bible scholars and theologians infected with rationality and revealed them to little children, that is, those whom the scholars despise and count unworthy or unqualified to serve Christ. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Now, to whom has the Son chosen to reveal the Father? We shall see in the next few verses. Jesus spoke of the Father, who is God, invisible, in heaven. He has never been seen and never will be seen. And the Son. The Son is God, visible on earth, even as he became visible through the angel of the Lord in the previous testament. The Holy Spirit, then, is God invisible, dwelling in and amongst us human beings who have faith in Jesus. After a few centuries, when the Latin language became dominant, these three, 
were called persone, which in Latin means masks. So Christians were likening the Trinity unto God wearing the Father mask, other times the Son mask, and yet other times the Holy Spirit. Theologians, however, eventually formulated this into a diagram. Then he turned it to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. The Son is revealing the Father to his disciples. When he says, Blessed are your eyes, these men and women would later serve as eyewitnesses to Jesus' words and deeds. Thus, there was a long period of time before Messiah came when prophets and kings anxiously awaited his arrival. With Jesus, then, came the Messiah, speaking the words and doing the deeds of the Father. And then, since the time of Messiah, following his death and resurrection and ascension into heaven, we have the eyewitness accounts and the testimony of his apostles. Now regarding Jesus and his relation with the Holy Spirit, his mother Mary was with child of the Holy Spirit. And God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit. He then went about doing good and healing. Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, was led by the Spirit, just as you and I may be led. Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father. This is perhaps the greatest sign of the filling of the Holy Spirit, is worship towards the Father. Jesus spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. And I shall send to you the Spirit of truth. He will testify of me. Repent, said Peter, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. And later, Paul wrote, No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Experience God through persistent prayer. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Compare the Lord's Prayer in Luke chapter 11 with a fuller version provided in Matthew chapter 8. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Temptation in the First Testament was when believers grumbled against God. So, what is it that Jesus is teaching us to pray? Is it a liturgy that we must recite, say these words, a model to emulate, say words like these? We note that every phrase in Jesus' prayer is taken from the Tanakh, the First Testament. Sanctify the name from Isaiah, your kingdom come from Zechariah, our daily bread from Exodus, forgive us our sins from the book of Numbers, and not to test God from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Jesus is teaching us to pray scripture. Hence this standard advice on prayer. If you are bored, then you are not praying. 
If you cannot think up what to say, then quote this prayer or other scripture. Then listen for unusual ideas to speak back to God. Identify somebody's need, think of a Bible promise or example, then ask the Father to meet that need. Always ask God to do something that only He can do. He likes to do so. God, angels, and demons are listening to your prayers, so mix in some short thanks and praise. This will cause the demons to flee. Never try to protect God's reputation by weakening your prayer requests. In fact, He often acts when scoffers are snickering at you. What's happening in this picture? Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. What then is importunity? If you are serious about your requests to God, then keep reminding him until he acts, or till he gives a definite no. I suggest that in your mobile telephone notes app, you start a list of urgent needs or long-term requests, and then read this list to God once a day. And tick off answers, replies, and provisions as they come. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Persistence matters. Now, the Greek original of all of these commands are continuous action verbs instructing us to keep on asking, keep on seeking, and keep on knocking. A. Keep asking God to give or to do only what He can give or do. Eventually, He will. S. Keep seeking for the opportunities that you are asking for. They will come. And K. Keep knocking when needs seem urgent. In an emergency, just shout, Lord, help, for he will not feel offended. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? Is this all? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? In the Second Temple period, in the first century CE, most folk believed that the Holy Spirit departed from Israel in the fifth century BCE and had not returned that he was available only to very holy folk, or that he belonged to a special end times community, such as the one at Qumran, who gave us the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, Jesus often spoke to current beliefs, a necessary understanding for those who interpret the Gospels. Now, what about the Holy Spirit in our Christian experience? First, our new birth, our regeneration and renewal are accomplished by the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit gives us assurance of our salvation, that is, he testifies that we are the children of God. It is from him that we receive peace and joy in our daily experience, and he accomplishes character development over time through the fruit of the Spirit. And then he gives to all believers gifts for speaking truth and for serving others. And then we can also pray in the Holy Spirit. So, in the text that we have read today, what did you discover? What truths could you affirm? What promises could you claim? And what commands must you obey? If you are in a group, then discuss these together. Your assignment for next time is to read in different translations Luke chapter 11 verse 14 through chapter 12 verse 12. Then visit the website for other materials and compile your own insights, queries and observations to share with others.